<laughs> no, I'm sorry. I have no comment on how I secretly revise my salacious comments in GitHub. <laughs> oh crap. I shouldn't have said it was salacious. Oh crap. I certainly shouldn't have said it was me. Oh crap. I certainly shouldn't have said that I checked them into GitHub. Ah, it's too hot today. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. Today, we're going to download the source code to MS-DOS from GitHub, build it, and run it on real hardware just like I did when I worked there. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Dave, aren't you a little young to have worked on MS-DOS? Well, perhaps you thought that before I stopped coloring my beard a while back, but to be fair, I did come into MS-DOS later, starting out on the last major release, 6.2. Now I got to work on some cool and meaningful features too, like smart drive CD-ROM caching, single pass disk copy, the new single disk setup, and so on. I'm also fortunate in that since it was the last major release, my code is immortalized in the last MS-DOS before we all moved on to Windows 95. The big MS-DOS news this month is the open source release of the MS-DOS version 4.00 code on GitHub. And today, I'm going to take you through some of that source as we build the entire project using the same compiler and assembler as I did back at Microsoft in 1993. Then write a disk image of it using a grease weasel, and then boot it on an original IBM PC XT to test it. Our test VC will be rocking the latest Microsoft Mach 10 speed doubler card and an original Chrome ball mouse, so you don't want to miss that. Along the way, I'll share some of my own MS-DOS stories, so let's get started. MS-DOS was based on something originally called QDOS, for Quick and Dirty Operating System. That system was developed by Tim Patterson of Seattle Computer Products as an operating system for the Intel 8086 processors. Seattle Computer Products needed an operating system for their new computer hardware, which was based on the then-new 8086 chip. But CPM86 was delayed in its release. QDOS was Tim Patterson's solution to fill that gap, and he famously developed it in just a few months back in 1980. Recognizing the potential for a standardized operating system in the burgeoning PC market, Microsoft acquired the rights to QDOS for $75,000 without disclosing their contract with IBM to develop an operating system for the first personal computer. Microsoft then hired Patterson to adapt QDOS into what would become MS-DOS, or the Microsoft Disk Operating System. When IBM introduced its first personal computer, the original IBM PC, in 1981, it came with MS-DOS as its main operating system, sold as PC-DOS. This version was essentially just a rebranded form of MS-DOS. Microsoft crucially retained the rights to sell MS-DOS to other vendors, effectively ensuring its place as the primary operating system vendor in the burgeoning PC market. Mark Zimikowski, known to us by his internal email of Mark Z, was appointed as the dev manager for MS-DOS, starting from version 2 through on to version 4. His tenure oversaw significant technical advancements in the system. Version 2, which was released in 1983, introduced support for the new 10 megabyte hard disks and was the first to support hierarchical file systems, a feature inspired by Unix. Version 3 came out in 1984, providing support for larger disk formats and networking capabilities, which were essential as PCs began to proliferate in business environments. And then version 4, launched in 1988, introduced support for the newly developed Microsoft Networks and included a graphical user interface called DOS Shell, reflecting the beginning shift towards more user-friendly interfaces that would be later epitomized by Windows itself. These developments under Mark Z's management were critical as they enhanced MS-DOS's capabilities to handle the needs of increasingly complex computing environments. MS-DOS's evolution under Mark Z marked a significant chapter in the history of software, laying down the software foundations upon which the PC revolution would really be built. The version of MS-DOS that we'll be looking at today, 4.00, is not the more common 4.01 that you're likely thinking of when you hear the term MS-DOS 4. Your confusion is well-merited, since the naming is more than a little subtle. But long story short, the 4.00 version was a special multitasking version of MS-DOS that had very little commercial success, and as far as I know, kind of began and ended with this version. The good news is that they both derive from the same MS-DOS 3.3 classic foundation, so the code is largely the same. When Microsoft initially released the MS-DOS 1.0 source code a few years back, it was still under a restrictive license, which made sense given that it was commercial software. But as Microsoft continues to embrace open source though, we've seen it open up things a lot more, and this time around it's using the MIT license. 
The MIT license is unrestricted, meaning you can use the software, modify it, copy it, merge it, publish it, distribute it, sublicense it, even sell it. So you could even make your own DOS and go head to head with Microsoft about 30 years too late. And that's something we'll do today. We'll download the source code from GitHub and then set up the same basic dev environment as I used back in the day, based around the MASM2 assembler and the C5.1 compiler. Now the assembler, as you might have guessed, translates assembly language into object code, whereas the C compiler transforms C code directly into object code. And then the C and the assembly object are joined together to make the final applications. When I joined, there are already several newer versions of MASM and C available than what we were using, but when you're building MS-DOS, you want the generated code to remain as similar as possible from version to version. And so once we locked onto an assembler and a compiler, it was pretty much forever. <laughs> My dog is snoring. When I joined the team, I was also kind of floored that there was no common library shared amongst all MS-DOS code if you were writing an assembler. I came in thinking there'd be an extensive standard lib of utility and helper functions, but it turns out even to do something as banal as output an integer on the console, you were on your own and converting it to ASCII. It was much better if you were in writing it in C, but the vast majority of MS-DOS is written in pure 86 assembly language. The code is easy to find online at github.com slash Microsoft slash MS-DOS. Once we've cloned the source tree, we can have a look at the project structure. Under the MS-DOS v4.0 folder, we find a set of folders. A few of them are self-explanatory, like BIOS, which deals with the hardware, and Boot, which deals with the system startup, and CMD, which contains all of the MS-DOS commands that are not directly built into command.com. By the way, you'll notice that I always say MS-DOS and not DOS. That was drilled into me on the team, which even included a penalty jar where you had to deposit cash if you made a mistake and just said DOS. I guess this was to distinguish it from PC-DOS, or maybe just to ensure that the Microsoft branding was always present, but I found it a bit odd. Since no one thought anything other than Microsoft when you said DOS, I figured they should just take the win, but those decisions were made way above my pay grade at the time. Let's examine a really simple MS-DOS command to see what some of the code looks like. In the CMD folder, we can see all of the standalone MS-DOS commands that, as I said, are not otherwise built into the command processor. For example, echo is a built-in command, but more is a standalone executable. One of the first things that more needs to do is to duplicate some file handles and redirect standard error and standard output. It does this by calling functions within MS-DOS itself, which it accomplishes via the int21 assembly instruction. What's int21? Well, whenever int21 is called, the system looks at the value of the AH register to determine what it is you're asking the system to do. Each basic operation, like opening a file, reading a file, and so on, has a number associated with that function. And that number tells the int21 service which one you're asking for. In this case, we've loaded AH with the value for xdupe, which tells the system that we want to duplicate the file handle that we're going to pass in in bx. The result comes back in the ax register and is stored in bp for safekeeping. And that's how you duplicate a file handle in MS-DOS in assembly language, in case the need ever arises for you. And we could follow this code just for more, step by step for an hour or more probably, but there simply isn't time to go through all the code like that today. Still, I wanted to give you a peek at what the code looks like at its most fundamental level. All told, there are 584 assembly language files and 65 C language files. Back in the day, as I recall, at least, it took about 90 minutes to two hours to build MS-DOS on my 386 dev system. Now, I do have a very nice IBM PS2 Model 95 with a 486 here in the shop, but I didn't want to do the work on the vintage hardware because I wanted fast turnaround as I was trying to get the thing to compile and build. And on my M2 Ultra Mac Pro, even though the DOS box environment I'll be using is only single-threaded, it's still fast enough that I can build the MS-DOS product in about five minutes. To perform the build, I simply launch DOSBox and then map drive C to point at the source folder on the Mac where the GitHub code lives. And in a perfect world, you just type and make it the root of the project and MS-DOS would pop out the other side. But it turns out we do not live in a perfect world. More to the point, the folks that uploaded the code to GitHub wound up mangling it a bit because GitHub translates line feeds and special characters in a way that doesn't work when you then check them back out and try to build them from MS-DOS. So to get this to work, I had to manually edit some files, change some lines, pass the code through a sed filter that remaps special characters, and then run Unix to DOS on the files to finish the job. I'll try to put a link to some of the info about those steps in the video description. Once I had done that, it was then as easy as typing nmake in the root, and we can watch the build fly on by. 
It cranks on through the ASM and C files quickly, builds the needed message tables, and when everything is finally done, we can run a copy.bat script that included that will dump all the binaries that we need into a final location. If we try to test out the new binaries within DOSBox, however, we discover that we get an incorrect DOS version error. That's because in DOSBox, we're running the equivalent of MS-DOS 5 and the 4.0 binaries aren't going to be directly compatible with version 5. To run version 4 binaries, we need to be booted into the version 4 command processor. We need to boot off a 4.0 disk to do that, but we have something of a chicken and egg situation here that I didn't rightly know how to solve. So instead I did a Kobayashi Maru, which is to say I cheated a bit when I ran out of options. What I wound up doing was taking an original 4.0 disk, read it in, converted that to a digital disk image, and then removed all the files from the image. That gave me a completely empty but bootable disk image. In other words, a blank floppy with the right 4.0 boot sector. I then copied all the new binaries that we just built into the image. Now you might wonder how I did things like writing a 360k image to a 5 quarter inch floppy on a modern PC. Because this requires a real 5 quarter inch drive, but how do you connect it? And I know of two possible options, the Cryoflux and the Grease Weasel. Both are little boards that you connect to your computer by USB and then to the drive itself with a 34 pin ribbon cable as you would have in the old days. That cable of course going from the drive to the board and then through USB to the PC. You can read and write disk images to and from floppy disks using the software supplied with whichever one you're using. Now the Cryoflux reads, writes, and stores low-level flux information coming directly off the disk heads, so it's the perfect solution for archiving rare and weird media. The Grease Weasel is slightly more pedestrian, but a lot easier to use. Thus, when I'm simply reading or writing standard disk formats like IBM PC floppies, I use the simpler Grease Weasel, and that's what we'll be doing today. One little tangent worth mentioning is the actual drive that we'll be using. We're writing a 360k floppy, but this is actually a more advanced 1.2 megabyte drive from the IBM AT days. It seems that internet lore holds that you can't or shouldn't write a 360k floppy in a 1.2 meg drive, ostensibly because the tracks are finer due to the fact that there are twice as many of them. So depending on who you believe, you cannot do this, but I assure you that it works fine. After all, the IBM AT could read and write both 360k and 1.2 meg floppies without a lot of fuss. The key is to set the head step to 2, so that every time the head steps when writing our 40 track image, it only uses every second track that the 80 track drive is actually capable of. I've done it, and for many formats, and never had an issue. But I think the reality is that even a 40 track drive has an excruciatingly thin magnetic track. If you've ever tried to set the head alignment on such a drive using an oscilloscope and a screwdriver, then you know that it takes only the slightest tiny adjustments. So in my mind, it's not like the 40-track drives are laying down some fat tracks that the 80-track drive can't later manage. And when you write the image on an 80-track drive, it doesn't wind up just drawing a skinny little stripe down the middle of the fat 40-lane, 40 40-track 40 line. It does the whole track just fine. Now, if you want to be completely correct and safe, get a 40-track drive for formatting and for writing 40-track images. All I'm saying is that the 80-track drive works fine in my office. And with that out of the way and the image complete, let's pop it out and take it over to my little museum area where an original IBM XT sits between an Altair and a PS2. This XT has been upgraded with the very rare Microsoft Mach 10 board that was donated to the channel by a viewer, so it runs at 10 MHz versus the original speed of 4.77. It even features the very first Microsoft mouse that shipped with Windows 1.0, which you can identify from above by its green buttons and from below by its stainless steel mouse ball. The memory test up to 640k takes about a minute to run and then the system will finally boot our image. And as soon as it does, I'm going to switch to desktop capture software so that I'm not stuck filming a green CRT for you. As soon as our hand-built MS-DOS 4.0 successfully boots, it asks for the time and date as specified in the autoexec.bat file. We press enter twice and we're at the MS-DOS prompt. Now because the 360k floppy is so tiny, there's really only the command processor and some video drivers on this boot disk. If I wanted to format the whole system, which I don't because it's already running 6.2 from the hard disk, I would then insert a second floppy with the format and fdisk commands that we built a few minutes ago, format the hard drive, make it all bootable with sys, and then copy all of our commands to the hard drive. But if you want to run floppy only on a 360k system, it's a lot of disk swapping. I hope you've enjoyed our little MS-DOS diversion today, and if so, please remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so do leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed to the channel, thank you. If you have any interest in matters related to or curiosity about the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. 
Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.